how difficult is it for life to appear? We don't really know, we only have one example, but really it took just a few hundred millions of years and, and it was going here on Earth. Okay, so I'm a theoretical physicist. So I'm working about really fundamental issues, the really fundamental laws of, of the universe. And the thing that I'm really interested in is the dark side of the universe. And it, it's probably began already as a child. I, I grew up under dark skies, but first I wanted to be some, something else. As at the age of five, I wanted to become a zoologist. And then at seven, then I decided that I wanted to do physics. Astronomy in particular, but physics really, theoretical physics, the fundamental, fundamental stuff. And it could be related to also that I spent many dark evenings lying in the grass outside of our house, looking up at the sky. And then I imagined that rather than looking up towards the stars, I was looking down into an abyss billions of light years deep. And then I lay down in the grass and hold myself tight to the grass so I wouldn't fall down into the darkness, down past the stars, the galaxies, out into the unknown. But actually, the thing that really interested me was not so much the stars, but rather the darkness between the stars. Because if you, if you look far away, then you also look back in time. You look at the moon, a second back in time, the sun, eight minutes, the star up there on the right, then I've been the swan, you look back to a time when the Roman Empire was something new and fresh. But if you let the line of sight go even further out, past every star in the Milky Way, tens of thousands of years back in time, and then even further, further away, past every galaxy, millions of years back in time, even billions of years back in time, then eventually there is nothing left to be seen because you're looking so way back in time that there is nothing to see because our universe didn't exist yet. And that's why it's dark. So the darkness that you see in the sky, the darkness between the sky, Stars, the reason why it's dark is because our universe hasn't existed forever. It had a beginning. So this is the most basic astronomical observation that you can ever imagine. It's the fact that it's dark at night. Okay, now if you have the right kind of equipment, then you can certainly look into the darkness and nevertheless see structures there. Because actually, that line of sight don't really go all the way to the moment of creation. Because the first few hundred thousands of years, then the, our universe wasn't transparent. It was foggy. It was a hot plasma. You couldn't see your hand in front of your eyes if you had been there. So that line of sight, it stops. It stops short of the moment of creation. And you see this fog that conceals, it hides that first moment. And there you can see structure. You need to have a telescope sensitive to microwave radiation, and then you can see structures, real structure. This is a real picture of something which existed like 14 billion years ago. The colors are not real. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's called the different uh, densities and wavelengths of, 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 of colors and densities of these clouds, but it's a real picture of something which existed at that time. And this is the kind of thing I do. I try to figure out whether these structures here can tell you something about what happened even earlier, maybe even before the beginning of our universe. But then I thought one day that uh, what if I try to look back instead? I've been now traveling out through the universe, past all these stars, galaxies, to the moment when a universe was created, even, even beyond, what if I try to look back again? What will I see? I'm certainly not the first one 
who tries to look back at Earth. 700 years ago, Dante Alighieri, in his Divina Commedia, did just that. He might have been the first. So when he climbed up the mountain of paradise together with his beloved Beatrice, then he looked back. He looked back down at the earth and described what he saw. My eyes returned through all the seven spheres and saw this globe in such a way that I smiled at its scrawny image. So don't imagine how he was high up over the earth looking down and saw that scrawny little image immersed in all this darkness. This is a real picture of that same uh, same kind of point of view. It's from the Voyager spacecraft. So it's, it's taken on the 14th of February, 1990. And many of you are present in that picture. Not all of you, I see, but some of you, most of you maybe, even was actually, or there in, that, in this picture. So it's taken at the outskirts of the solar system, looking back at the Earth. A scrawny little image. Others have done the same and uh, expressed their feelings very eloquently, uh, like Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man on the moon. Uh, he, he, he writes the following. From out there on the moon, international politics looks so petty. You want to grab a politician by the scruff of the neck and drag him a quarter of a million miles out and say, look at that, you son of a bitch. That's sort of in the spirit of Dante, again. This reversed perspective. You are traveling somewhere else, discovering wonderful things, and then you look back and say, hey, how, how does this fit together, actually? What does this tell us about our own life here on Earth? Well, there is another picture which illustrates this in a marvelous way. This is taken by, not really a satellite, it's a, it's a space probe which is positioned one and a half million kilometers from Earth in the direction of the Sun. The gravitational fields of the Earth and the Sun balance in such a way that this, this space probe can hang there and just look down on the Earth in this Dante-like perspective, just over the day side. So if you want to know where it is, it's just where the Sun is one and a half million kilometers away. And at this specific, specific moment, it was actually at three in the morning on the morning of the 17th July 2015. You can actually see Scandinavia up here somewhere under the clouds, but that's not the important thing. But the important thing is that at that moment, the moon happened to pass across the Earth. And here you see the contrast between the moon and the earth. It's really life and death. I mean, earth with all its beautiful colors, everything sign or signs that there are marvelous things going on here. The blue and the white and the green and the brown, everything. And the moon, dead, black and gray. And so close to each other, life and death, just next to each other in a universe which is rather in unhospitable, most of it. These are not things that you usually think about when you go around and, and do your... just living your life. Still, the signs are there. I mean, uh, how about the way our earthly life is connected with what's happening up there. Magellan, for instance, when he sailed around the Earth made use, of, made use of that. So he sailed around South America here, and then he came out in this sea that he called the Pacific Ocean. And then luckily, the westerly winds blowing from the east, the trade winds, that brought him across the ocean. And these winds, they have everything to do with Earth as part of the universe, because Earth is rotating. And as hot air is rising from the tropics, 
winds are blowing towards the tropics, but the speed of the equator is higher than the speed of the rest of the world. I mean, since it's, it's rotating, so it's going quick around the equator, the wind lags and in this way start to blow towards the west. So it's a rotating Earth. The Earth is part of the universe that made it possible for Magellan to, to, to sail in the way that he did. There are, of course, other signs as well, especially in our part of the world. Uh, this is a picture from, from Scotland. The three parallel roads of Glen Roy. It was a mystery that eluded even Charles Darwin in the middle of the 19th century. You can vaguely see these three lines here on the hillside. When you are there and look at it, it looks surreal. Some, somebody had photoshopped reality because these lines, they are continuing all around, jumping from one hillside to another. Nobody had a clue what it could be. Eventually, I realized that these are old shorelines from glacial lakes. One of many signs that the world had changed, that there was an ice age some thousands of years back. Again, a result of the fact that we are part of a universe with planets, solar system. And this is actually basically the same picture that I started off with. But all these other planets, in particular the big ones, are affecting the way our Earth is moving around the sun. The tilt of the axis of the Earth, the shape of the orbit, sub subtly affecting the climate and actually causing the ice ages over the last few millions, millions of years. So space affects Earth, and Earth affects life, but life sometimes hit backs, hit back as well. Like two billion years ago, when life changed the color of the sky from pink to blue. This has to do with, with the sun. The sun is, uh, is a rather violent object. Uh, you don't really see this unless you have the right kind of telescope. There are lots of stuff happening up there. And the sun has slowly grown brighter during the billions of years since it was, was born. And uh, this is something which eventually will uh, spell the doom for all life on Earth. In a roughly one billion years from now, the, all the oceans will simply boil away because the, the sun will be so bright. In the beginning of the history of the solar system, the sun was a lot fainter, but there was a lot of methane, methane in the air. There was a strong greenhouse effect, which kept the temperature at the level that could sustain life. But then, two billion years ago, life made a discovery. The blue-green algae made a wonderful discovery, photosynthesis. And then there was a new dangerous gas that was released, oxygen. First it was absorbed by the seas, but then eventually it was let out in the atmosphere, where it reacted with the methane, which went away the skies turned from pink to blue. They have been blue since then. The greenhouse effect was reduced. Temperatures dropped. And there was a big ice age that lasted for tens of millions of years. And almost killed off all life. So this marvelous invention could have been the end of all life on Earth. But somehow it managed to recover, and volcanoes spread out new uh, uh, greenhouse gases in the, front in the form of carbon dioxide, and then temperatures went up again. Another similar invention of life, uh, some 300 million years ago, also caused some trouble. Troubles that we actually still today are somewhat involved in. Um, that ice age, this is some 
some remnants from, from that time. This is in a park outside of Adelaide, where you can see uh, some formations which date back to the end of that ice age, almost 300 million years ago. That ice age was caused by another invention, trees. So big forests were growing around the equator of the Earth, sucking down carbon dioxide that was bound into the trees that fell and were buried in swamps or seas. On the other hand, there were lots of oxygen coming out in the atmosphere. It was still warm around the equator, but the reduction of carbon dioxide caused an ice age in the northern and southern parts of the Earth, even though it was still hot around the equator. The air was easy to breathe. So there were dragonflies and the size of eagles and spiders the size of dogs running around in the bushes. Exciting time. But then, then, of course, it eventually it ended. And you could think that, okay, that was a curiosity in the history of the Earth that doesn't affect us anymore. But actually, it does. And it was really, it was really these gigantic spiders that was in my thoughts a night two and a half years ago, just before Christmas. It was just a few days before Christmas. And this is a picture taken outside of, of our house. And um, it looks very gloomy. And it was a very gloomy night because... And the reason why I was thinking about these spiders were at, was that the temperature at that evening, just a few nights before Christmas, was the same as the temperature at Midsummer's Day, the same year, some 10 degrees or something like that just in the middle, hopeless temperature to do anything in. And then I was thinking about these spiders. Why were I thinking about these spiders? Because all of those trees that fell at that time and was buried there in the swamps and the, and the seas, they were converted into coal. And that coal is contributing to the increased greenhouse effect today. So in a sense, you could say that the heat that was stored at that time and caused the Earth to be engulfed in this ice age, that heat is now returning to us today. It's sort of a, a kind of a greeting from these gigantic spiders 300 million years ago. Because that is, of course, what is happening now. Uh, this restrained heat is uh, coming back and will change the world that we are living in. Not necessarily so that it will become in inhabitable. I mean, life has changed, has survived and adapted before. I mean, all of these ice ages, almost all life wiped out. And what about these... The, the asteroid that almost killed off all life, well, it killed the dinosaurs and, 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 and let us uh, continue evolving. And other catastrophes, so it's, it's not really that, but the question is, what will happen to us? Is there a possibility to predict what will happen to us? Well, maybe. Again, we should look out into the universe, to other planets. Here's one of them. This is Mars. Probably no life there, maybe some microbes. It's too cool. It's a bit too far out. This is Venus. Certainly no life. Hundreds of degrees. Um, it's absolutely dead. And then there is the Earth just in between. In our solar system, we can be pretty sure that we are we can be sure that we are alone in the sense of having a, a civilization. But what about other planets further out? Well, actually, we do know now there exist other planets around other stars. Here's one of them. Uh, this is a picture I took together with a friend of mine. We were out with a telescope and with a good camera. And this one here, that little star, Kepler-452, the distance of 1,500 light years, it's almost a copy of our sun. You need to have a really big telescope to see it. 
and it doesn't look too much, right? It's a rather scrawny image, you might say. But around it, there is a planet, the size of the Earth, at the right about the right distance. And there are probably lots of other examples here. You could also imagine that maybe there's someone there looking at us and seeing a similar little tiny image among all the countless stars. So there are probably lots of planets out there, and maybe some of them, lots of them are like Mars, other ones like Venus, but since there are so many of them, surely there must be a large number that is like our Earth. And here comes the clue now. Let's see. There are probably lots of planets out there which are like the Earth which have the right conditions for life to appear. Now, let's see. How difficult is it for life to appear? We don't really know, we only have one example, but really, it took just a few hundred millions of years, and, and it was going here on Earth. That was pretty quick, given, this, I mean, given the, the, the scales of what we are now thinking about. So, that means that there should be a lot of life out there. Then, admittedly, it took a few billions of years because it, before it evolved in anything that looked like plants or animals. So there might be some kind of a difficult threshold there, but after all, the universe is so big, so surely it should have happened many times. Civilizations should have devol developed, and these civilizations, they should start to send spacecrafts around the universe, put up big signs and say, this is our galaxy, stay away. And we look around and we see nothing. This is the best picture that we have. And you, well, you can't see anything. There is no sign here saying, here are we. Nothing. This could be a clue. Let's say that life is common. Not only microbes, but even animals and plants are the equivalent. Maybe even civilizations are common. Why don't we see any? This is one of the most important questions, to be honest. And it's not just philosophical or curiosity, science fiction, entertainment. This is a crucial question that are bearing on what we do here today on this Earth. Because imagine the possible answers to this question. It could, of course, be that most of these civiliza civilizations, that we don't see them because they are well, I mean, they have grown old and wise, and they don't travel around. They sit and read books and go and listen to lectures and make music or whatever. You don't really see too much of them. That's one possibility. Another, much more scary possibility is that most of them die young. They can't survive because they reach some threshold in their technological development, and they are not equipped to handle the problems that they, that they are facing. That could be one possible answer for why it's so quiet out there. So then, what does that tell us in the situation that we are now? Could it be that we are reaching that critical point where so few, if any, actually make it? I simply hope that we will be the first in that case. Thank you.